Okay, howdy everyone. Um, welcome to um, sub part two of the hearing and noise lectures, uh, the hearing and noise topics on a measuring sound. All right. Okay, so I need to uh, up front. I'm going to make a distinction between a couple of concepts, and I and you're going to start to see um, similarities to when we were talking about illumination and defining you know, total luminous flux, uh, luminous intensity, illuminance, you know, luminance. Right. All right. So we're going to do the same thing for sound here. Okay. So I'm going to distinguish the total amount of sound energy that is emitted per unit time from a source uh, is our sound power. Okay. And power and then sound pressure that's coming up next. They, they don't look all that different uh, unless you're looking closely. So sound power uh, is a property of the source. Um, so what you're seeing here are basically like sound labs where they would say, hey, we have, we have a, a new designed washer that we think is especially quiet. Um, can you do your full analysis and determine what is the total amount of sound energy emitted by this thing? Um, you know, or other devices here. And then, you know, they could be rated here in, in, you know, on a common scale. Um, so a couple key points, just like total luminous flux, hmm, uh, this is about the energy that is the sonic energy emitted in all directions. Uh, it does not depend on anybody to be there to hear it. Okay. So tree falls in the forest. Does anybody clap to hear it or whatever? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so so um, so this doesn't matter. We're not talking about any ears there to receive anything. It's just how much uh, energy is transformed into this propagating waveform. All right. Sound pressure. Now, this is usually what we're interested in because this is talking about when the sound reaches the ear. What's the characteristic of it? What's the you know? What's its um um. Um, it's in its amplitude, its intensity, right? Okay, so sound pressure is kind of analogous to um, illuminance in that it's ultimately, it's the effect of the total luminous flux in a certain direction illuminating something. And so this is total sound power propagating a you know, sound wave, and then that sound pressure is what's interesting to us when it reaches something that's hearing, you know, or, or you know, a, a microphone or an ear, okay? So it's the effect of the sound power. The, the sound power is, is essentially, you know, the energy transformation is the cause, the effect is the sound pressure and, and the waveform that propagates that pressure. All right, so our units here, I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous one. We can talk about power in terms of watts, just like electrical power. Okay, so the the units of sound pressure we have several different, uh, you know, depending on if you're SI units or whatever, but they are convertible. So um, we're mostly going to talk about dynes per centimeter squared, um, and you'll see why when we start doing the math, it it, it tends to be it tends to be how the how the problems work out. Um, but know that you could convert you know, these, these measures of these standard measures of uh, pressure, um, you know, back and forth and, and it's all valid here. All right. So now sound pressure, as opposed to sound power is dependent on the distance and the orientation from the sound source. Well, I guess the distance from the sound source. So for the same, you know, sound energy emitted, um, if you're closer, it is experienced as louder. Uh, so the distance matters. <clears throat> Uh, also, remember that sound can propagate through any medium, and so the qualities of the propagating medium, so if it's, you know, atmosphere, um, things like the temperature, the humidity, um, if there's wind or turbulence, um, this all matters because it's essentially the, this is the, the matrix over which this uh, pressure wave is going to propagate, uh, and so all of these factors affect both, you know, the, the propagation, but then, you know, the, the response to different uh, uh, pressure dynamics. All right, so yes, so we are interested in this class at, of the sound pressure at the point of essentially the human ear or whatever, whatever we're um, interested in measuring. Uh, and and this will be, do we have enough sound pressure to have a satisfactory hearing experience? You know, is it loud enough to be distinguished? And then the, the, 
bigger emphasis, I guess, in this class is, is that sound level dangerous? Um, and if so, you know, there are engineering solutions there. So again, that sound pressures, I think it's analogous to illuminance, how much of this propagated sound energy is illuminating or essentially vibrating, you know, my, my ear, um, my inner ear, my tympanic membrane. All right. Okay. So power and pressure. So conveniently, um, you know, this, this term power works pretty universally across, uh, uh different types of energy. So, um, uh, apologies if this gives some of you PTSD, but, um, the, uh, if you remember back to, um, circuits or maybe even physics and this concept of Ohm's law voltage is e equivalent to the current in a circuit, um, out, uh, by the multiplied by the resistance, um, over which that current acts. Right. Okay. So the cool thing is we can equate Ohm's law with when we're talking about the flow of, um, you know, electrical uh, electrons, basically, with the flow or the movement of a propagating waveform in in sound power. Okay, so check it out. Um, we can say P is electrical power here. Uh, P is sound power here. Uh, we have electrical potential. So, um, you know, the voltage is is not is not power in itself it has the potential for for you know uh for doing work and similarly uh pressure uh air pressure if you can imagine that as having uh the potential to do work it's going to you know put a, a pressure it's it is um influencing air molecules to move there you go so each our potential energy, right? Uh, I is our, our flow of electrons, the, the current. And Q in this case is, uh, is the metric that's used for the volume flow rate. If you can imagine this is like the pressure wave is, you know, how many, how many molecules is it moving, uh, you know, per, per, um, per, per unit time. And then uh, we have two metrics. So, so resistance is like, you know, if you can think of it as this is, the quality of the material that resists the flow of electrons. Similarly, this, this uh, uh, metric uh, or this um, concept of acoustic impedance is, if you can imagine you're propagating a sound through a medium, how much does that medium resist changing its structure due to the propagating waveform, the, the, the pressure wave? And we have this equation here, uh, which, which relates uh, the acoustic impedance, the pressure, and the uh, volume flow rate. Now, check this out. So if we go over here and we, if you, if you don't remember this, this is another, on top of Ohm's law here, um, power is equivalent to the potential multiplied by the, the action. Um, and so the, the, the current times the uh, voltage and so, you know, voltage times current. And then if we using V equals IR, that identity, we can solve for it and we get um, power is e equivalent to the voltage squared divided by the resistance. And look at that, we can do the same sort of relationship here. So if we say power is the pressure uh, multiplied by, by, the, by the flow rate, um, and we solve, you know, with similar to that Ohm's um, relationship, we get uh, pressure squared divided by the acoustic impedance. Okay, so that was a mathematical proof. You're not gonna have to do that. Boring. <laughs> You're not gonna have to do that at all for, for, for this class. I just like to know, hey, where did numbers come from when I start to show you an equation? Because there's a 20 in that equation and you're gonna know where the heck did that 20 come from and it's not arbitrary. So it has to do with this. Okay, so um, the, this subtopic is called measuring sound. And, and essentially, uh, so far we've talked about, well, sound power uh, and sound pressure levels. We mostly are interested in so sound pressure levels, um, which is basically a way of saying how much louder than some other standard is it? So just like with, remember um, Joe Standler, Standard, the 2020, uh, uh, a standard that is just kind of arbitrary. We said everybody's acuity is just relative to this arbitrary. Well, 
I mean, it was arbitrary, but it makes sense, right? The five um, subtended five uh, 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 um, minutes of arc at 20 feet is, uh, is able to be read. Um, so anyway, we have similarly sort of, we need just like a standard so that when we talk about how loud something is, we know what the, we're, it's relative to, okay? Um, and so if we look at just pressures here, uh, I just wanna point out um, the, the range is, you know, seven orders of magnitude, which makes it kind of goofy to talk about, well, you know, is this, if I go from 0.0002 to 0 0.0003, is that meaningful on a scale that might also include this? So um, we basically have a different way that we refer to um, the, the sound pressure as a ratio. So again, we sort of have like, here's our, our, our standard and everything is a ratio that refers to that standard. Um, and so we also, because we had these seven orders of magnitude in order to make it a little more, um, you know, workable, uh, we did log, we, <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell and his homies at, uh, at Bell Labs, um, <laughs> not Taco Bell, <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell of, of, AT, of Bell Labs became AT&T, Bell Labs became AT&T, and now charges you too much in your cell phone bill. Um, but also his name uh, uh, was lent to a unit uh, called a Bell, a B-E-L, and I will show you what that looks like, but it's basically a log transformation of a ratio of emitted energies. All right, I think that's what's, yeah, here we go. All right, so if I'm interested in, you know, the sound pressure, that's not exactly, um, you know, the, the measure that I'm looking for because it's pressure is oscillating. And so it's really kind of difficult to, um, you know, kind of like with electronics, when you have to look at the, you know, um, uh, the RMS value. So the value over time, it, it, I kind of think of it that way. It gets goofy because it's an oscillating signal. So it's not that straightforward. Um, so we do want to look at these ratios because they become meaningful for us. We know what it's like if we double the, um, the ratio in this pressure. What, do, what does that mean in terms of the experience? Well, then we just kind of have that relate back to our standard. All right. So, okay. So let me, let me back up here. If we are interested in what is the sound power level, it's the, so once I start saying, um, you know, I've, I've got these large scales and i'm interested in this ratio because otherwise in an absolute sense one of these numbers doesn't really mean anything i need it in a ratio i need it in reference to a standard just like 2020 only means something because there's a standard that goes with it right okay so we have a ratio um sound power level in bells this is uh basically defining how many bells is how much is the ratio uh, how many orders of, of, of 10 um, is the ratio, basically. Um, and so now notice this, bells and decibels, dB, maybe I didn't say that clearly, um, is one-tenth of a bell. So just like I have a meter and then a decimeter is one-tenth of a meter, a bell and then a decibel is one-tenth of a bell. And so 10, um, um, sorry, Yes, sorry, T uh, 10 decibels equals one bell, right? So it's just a, I guess just, that's where it comes from anyway. All right, so here we go. We've got 10 times uh, a log of, of that ratio so that we can know how many decibels we're talking sound power level, right? So if I have one meter, I have 10 decimeters, right? Uh, and then remember our relationship here uh, that we just solved for, um, you know, that was related to the sound power and, and pressure relationship. Um, so I'm going to now plug in for P1 and P2, I'm going to plug these guys in and I'm going to assume that I've got a ratio, um, of pressures acting over the same medium. So it doesn't really make much sense if I say, you know, power one was measured, you know, um, with my sound meter up here and power two was on the moon or, or underwater or something. We're going to assume we're going through the same medium with this sound. So Z and Z are not Z1 and Z2. They're the same Z, right? All right. Mathematically, now we can cancel those out. And now we have 
10 log of, you know, the square of this ratio. And now you maybe remember, oh, there's another trick we can do with logarithms, where if you take a square, you can basically, you know, remove that exponent of two and bring it out to the front. So if you don't believe me on that, Google it. If you still don't believe me, come to office hours, that works. Um, so again, I, I take the square, um, I take the exponent out of this ratio and I move it outside of the logarithm and it becomes a multiplicand. So 20 log of the ratio of pressures. Okay, so now we've moved from capital P power. Now we're talking about, well, you know, now we're talking sound pressure levels. So this is ultimately right here. This is where I want you to basically, this is your, your, your most basic um, equation that you'll be using for calculating sound levels uh, in this course. All right, there it is. Now, I, it is important to note what are the, you know, what are the units here? Technically, decibels are not a unit. Decibel is, is kind of like radian. Uh, it's one of these things, it's, a, it's an expression of, a, of the fact that it's a logarithmic ratio or it's a logarithm of a ratio, okay? So again, this just basically says ratio. Uh, uh, so then you need an additional qualifier. So I've got decibels, sound pressure level. So this should be a lowercase p to not distinguish there. Sorry about that. But actually, technically, sound power level is usually abbreviated with a W. I'm, I didn't go there because I didn't want to confuse you, but then I went there. So I hope it didn't confuse you. <laughs> um, but SPL, sound pressure level, that's going to be what um, we're, we're always talking about here with this ratio here. SPL, good. So from, from here out, SPL, sound pressure levels, okay? Um, all right, so um, when we talk about decibels uh, in a sound system, uh, and so I'm looking at, you know, something like an amplifier here you might have, you know, with a stereo or, or a TV system. Um, what this is telling us here, plus 16.0 decibels, is I have a ratio relative to the input auditory signal and this is how much I'm either amplifying it or minifying it, okay? And so decibels, again, is basically just saying this is the magnitude of the ratio, okay? Um, so there's a logarithm, in, a logarithm in there which makes it a little more complicated to, you know, to think your head around, um, but that's essentially what it's saying. So it's always, a, it, it's saying plus 16. It's not saying volume is absolutely this level. It's saying I am amplifying whatever the input was by this much. Okay, so now well, what is it called then? What, how did we make sense of it then if we say, well, I don't have an input signal to like whatever I'm just hearing in my natural environment. Um, so that's when we say, okay, well, we have our Stanley standard. We have our reference pressure. This is our, if, if nothing else, if, you, if I'm not asking you, hey, how much does this change going up or down, by the way, there's a homework question where um, you do need to re remember that decibels are about a ratio and not an absolute number. There's a homework problem. Got to remember that. Okay. Um, but now, in the absence of asking about how much am I going up or down, just tell me what's the sound pressure level in this room right now. So this is where we say, okay, let's use our Stanley standard P uh, naught. And P naught is defined, this is just a constant, it's just a standard, just like five minutes of arc, um, is 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared. And you may recognize, I've seen that number very recently, and it's basically a mosquito sound. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the level of environmental um, uh, auditory sound pressure level that's produced typically by a mosquito. That's, that's not like a scientific constant mosquito level of noise, but it just kind of works out that way. Um, so yeah, so I need to know the, um, the sound pressure level of the item that's being heard or, or described, and then I can do the ratio uh, over that, that reference pressure, which is always this number. By the way, uh, don't miss a digit here. It's, it's a common mistake where I see 0 0.002. 
there this is two ten thousandths right so it's the fourth ten to the negative two times ten to the negative fourth i think i think i did that right but yes this three zeros <laughs> and then the two don't don't miss it all right there you go all right so mosquito i plug in everything i get that ratio of um you know zero uh, i'm sorry um the logarithm of one is zero times anything is zero all right there he is uh, the jet engine. And so now we can put in that 1,000 dynes per centimeter squared. We can see that, that that's a meaningful ratio here. We get 134 decibels. Uh, so now for, if I'm talking about an audible range from zero to 134, it makes a lot more sense with the way that we physically experience sound levels um, because we don't experience sound levels in a linear fashion. We experience them in a way that kind of maps to this logarithm. Um, so zero to 134, and, and we're gonna make sense of that. I mean, it, it can get higher than that, but this is already, you can tell, um, because it's a jet engine, this is a dangerous, in fact, extremely dangerously high uh, 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 level of sound. Don't uh, expose yourself to that if you can help it without hearing protection for sure. Oh, and check this out. Oh, by the way, Dr. F likes to ask questions that make it sound like the mosquito is the most silent, mo like the most, the minimum thing that a human ear can hear. That's not true. Um, it just happens that the mosquito kind of matches pretty close to the reference pressure, okay? Um, but there are things that are audible that are according to the way that we measure this re relative to the reference pressure are audible as negative values, okay? So don't forget that. So basically, and this, could also be kind of a way of saying, hey, what if I take the sound level on my amplifier and I cut it in half? I go from five or I go from 10 to five. Okay, what can I expect, um, you know, in terms of the experience? Well, it's about um, if I'm having, sorry. I, sorry, that was a bad example because I said it backwards. You're usually adjusting the, on the decibel scale, but what does it mean in terms of the change in pressure? Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, basically if it's half the pressure, it equates to, uh, about six decibels, um, of change. In fact, that's, uh, if you go up or down doubling or having that sound pressure, uh, equates to plus or minus six decibels. So if it's twice the pressure plus six decibels. So that's always kind of a, a nice, uh, approximation when, you know, you're interpreting what's going on with this. Okay, and so some sound pressure levels, because again, we have the reference pressure that we uh, uh, relate all this to, uh, just a couple of common things that you might uh, uh, relate to. So, you know, 110 decibels, uh, which you might experience for a limited amount of time, you know, three to five hours at that, you're going to have a little bit of uh, ringing in your ears, you're going to have a little bit of what we call temporary threshold shift. Um, but it's probably not going to have, you know, any any major lifetime damage. Now, if you do this every night, if you're a roadie from Metallica, um, you are going to have accelerated hearing loss. And we'll talk about that in subsection, subtask, sub uh, 7.5. All right, rock concerts. Oh, oh so um, after you retire from Metallica and you go back to medical school and then you find yourself in, you know, um, uh, emergency rooms, which you thought, okay, this is much safer on my hearing, bad news, um, because there are some, you know, um, instruments used in specialty fields, including surgery, uh, that would emit, uh, some problematic sound levels and being very close to these instruments. Remember that matters as far as sound pressure is the distance. Um, we need to, you know, we have to take that into account. So if you have a really loud, even if it's a, a small, if it's, if it's loud enough and you're close enough, we can have some major uh, hearing problems. All right. <clears throat> oh, so we, uh, I did some research in the past on how loud can it be in neonatal intensive care units? And uh, it needs to be very, very quiet there. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do in terms of designing a space that has to facilitate, you know, has to be able to support people talking to each other and doing normal activities. Um, but there is a standard there. And finally, uh, and this is something we will get to, I think in some, yeah, in 7.5 also, um, there is a, an allowable uh, um, sound dosage 
uh, that is defined by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, and this is like a legal standard, basically, like uh, OSHA can come in and say, you must change something about your working uh, facility in order to, you know, to, to better protect the, the hearing of the, of the workers who are here. And so there are ways to calculate, you know, um, somebody's sound noise dosage that will actually we'll get to that pretty soon, I think. Oh, good sound meters. Okay. So I have, um, I have one in my office, which is not, you know, here right now. Um, that's pretty sophisticated. Uh, but I also then just went ahead and downloaded um, these, these apps, they're very, you know, easy to get. Um, this was free. Um, what is this one called? I don't know, I can't endorse it. If this is on YouTube, whatever, but it's a pretty nice one. Um, like pretty much the first one I found. Um, and what you're seeing here. So typically, what I say is when I'm usually in a lecture hall, <clears throat> and I'm lecturing 70 decibels, is a pretty fair, fair estimate, because I'm usually trying to project myself to some degree, it's not quiet, like, like a library or like an office setting, somebody is talking. But I, I usually think of like 65 to 70 as normal office uh, uh, sound pressure levels. Right now, as I talk and look at this thing, it's right around, it's hovering right around 70. This is not going to be as accurate as my sound meter that I have in my office, but you know, it kind of gets gets you somewhere with this. It gives you an idea about what we're dealing with. Okay, so um, if you have a sophisticated, um, you know, app or 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 a real meter, uh, a lot of times you may see this uh, qualification DB and then parentheses A, and maybe just DBA. And what does that mean? So this is basically um, a filter um, that interprets the incoming sound based on the, the frequencies in that sound, because the human ear responds differently to different frequencies. And we'll talk about what's interesting about that. But basically, this is kind of the uh, activation curve. So if you look at dB of A, this means make the so if you if you have a, you know, a mechanical ear, a machine ear, this is make the machine ear interpret the incoming sound pressure like a human ear. Okay. And what's interesting about this is so frequency here, lower, smaller frequencies mean lower pitches, right? Boom, 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 right. And what this is showing is essentially lower pitches are heard with less neural activation, less relative response than higher frequencies. And in fact, there is a sweet spot. And I'll tell you right now, it's at about 4000 hertz. And I'll show you what that sounds like in a moment. Um, but this matters for how humans will interpret more complex sounds. It matters quite a bit. Um, so again, if you're um, if you're trying to measure, you know, sound levels, that is, is this what's this going to be like to a human ear? The decibels of A, dB of A filter uh, is usually what you want to use. dB of C, I always say that's kind of like um, that's just leave it as a machine ear. And I couldn't find a good answer for what dB of B weighting is. So I, you never see it. You almost never see it. Um, and so I just don't know what it is, but it's between the two. <laughs> so you do need to know. I mean, yes, you do need to know what dB of A means and why it matters. Um, and probably you should know how to distinguish it from dB of C, which is effectively almost no weighting. If a system has any sort of weighting, it's dB of A or dB of C. As I mentioned, here's our, our, our range of um, uh, frequencies and we, uh, of, in the audible spectrum, and we have different degrees of action basically in our neural receptors at different frequencies. Kind of like how we have, you know, cones are receptive, rods and cones each have their peak sensitivity, you know, to certain wavelengths of light. The auditory system as a whole has peak sensitivity. And it's basically like right, down here. Okay, so what you're seeing is this is the minimum threshold that has to be crossed on the y axis. This is sound pressure level, you know, in decibels. Um, the, so the minimum amount of that uh, sound pressure level that will um, cause a, 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 a will, will lead to a sensation and then a hearing perception. And note that, yeah, if these frequencies are low, I need to get up there, I need to get a pretty good amount of energy in order to really shake those tympanic membranes 
at, you know, at, with the amount of power that would have me interpret this as a low bass sound, right? But, oh, we've got a really nice sweet spot right here. Again, 4,000 hertz. Are you ready? This is 4,000 hertz. So that now doesn't necessarily sound louder because this synthesizer probably does something like automatically uh, corrects for the fact that that is a really sensitive frequency. So it's probably putting it out with with relatively lower um, auditory, um, r relatively lower sound power. Um, but then ultimately that translates to, well, we have such high sensitivity to it that it sounds that much more vibrant, right? Um, there it is. So 4,000 hertz. The, the uh, overall range, this is an estimate, but roughly 20 hertz, very, very low um, and almost, you know, the, the, this is like growling tiger um, sort of range. So when a tiger, you know, really large beasts are, are, are growling, that's basically the first, <laughs> the, the lowest end of things we can hear. I mean, okay. Um, and then the high end, now here's this, an interesting uh, recognition. See this bubble here that says speech. Well, um, there is a particular um, demographic uh, that has higher, part of this uh, uh, region, and that would be children. Uh, and so little kids are talking up in this region, this would be kind of their fundamental speaking frequency. Um, also, bad news, as we become grandparents, um, uh, and as we age, we're losing mostly the high end of the spectrum. Um, we don't really lose our ability to hear at the low end, uh, not, not, not nearly as much. So it's much, much more loss at the high end. So this is why grandparents can't hear the grandkids. <laughs> grandpa, grandpa, right? So I always make, yeah, okay. I hope, I don't know if I did that joke very well, but basically, yeah, this is, this is the scientific explanation also why, um, you know, crotchety old men maybe can't hear their, their wives anymore at a, certain, <laughs> at a certain age, but they can still hear their deep voiced buddies, I guess, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, we have a little bit of math in this, uh, in this subtopic, and then there's a lot more coming. Um, but we can uh, combine sources. So if, imagine we have, you know, pieces of like, we've got multiple um, uh, uh, sound meters, and we're going around a room, and we're measuring things at different, uh, you know, what, what's the contribution from from that machine? What's the contribution to the noise from that machine? Um, it all matters, because it all adds to, you know, a big pile of noise that your ear has to deal with. Um, but it's kind of difficult to say, well, you know, like, what does it happen when everything is on? <laughs> what's, what's that like? That can be a very difficult thing to measure. So if we could get pieces of, of each of these things and we could then say, all right, well, now let's combine them in an environment. What's the resultant combination? Now, if I'm already in my car and I'm blasting rock and roll music super loud and my phone rings, my phone is not going to add necessarily it's 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 too it's not close enough in producing the same sound pressure levels to really influence the overall sound pressure of of my car okay so it really only matters when you've got two sound sources that are fairly close together and that's where this table comes into play now um i've looked online several times uh, uh, to try to find a more complete version of this table. If anybody finds one online and can cite it, um, not only will I say, hey, that's awesome and good, good for you for finding another outside source that you are, can validly use in your homework and exams, but I'll probably use that too. <laughs> so uh, what really irritates me is that this is literally what I've found exactly verbatim how I've seen this table uh, like represented in several different publications. It's eight to 10 and then dot, dot, dot 18. And then that's it. <laughs> so I just have to write equations, you know, write, write uh, problems that typically don't deviate too much from this. But what we need to do is to say, okay, if I've got, I think I've got to come in here, use this, use literally this table, like use this slide. Um, but basically you say, all right, I'm going to start with the loudest source um, in this space and the second loudest source. And I'm going to put those together and say, what's their resultant sound level. And then I'm going to take the next 
highest source and I'm going to add it to the pile. And I'm going to keep doing that until I get here, this stack pile, this one right here is so much higher than my cell phone ringing that this just doesn't make any influence anymore. Okay, so here's a little more formal for that. Um, so, yep, add the two highest ones, take the third highest, put it on there, keep going. So here's our example. Okay, so, um, you know, I've got these, uh, these machines are rated at, you know, these various, uh, uh, um, we, we know, you know, from the manufacturer that these are the sound power levels of these machines. So before I buy them, if I'm going to put them in here, what sort of sound level might I expect? And is that going to be, you know, um, a problematic level? We, we don't know yet what's problematic. I'll tell you, though, that um, 90 decibels is where we have problems. Uh, so we want to know, okay, well, none of these are individually over 90 decibels, but what happens when they all go in the same space? Okay. All right. So first thing we say, you know, here are our individual sound, you know, sound pressure levels. And so I say, well, what are the two highest ones? Those would be the shop noise and the vending area, 80 decibels and 78. So I look at the difference between those two, and that is um, that is two decibels. And so then I go to my table here. What is the difference between the two? Zero, one, two. And so 2.1, that is the additional uh, uh, sound level on top of the loudest source that having that, that near to it second source gives it. So 80 plus 2.1. So now I'm at 82.1 when I consider the pile of sound that comes from these two sources. So now, what's the next best, you know, next highest one? That would be the air handling, and that's 75 decibels. So I don't, you know, I don't reduce it to set 80 or 78 again. I've got my piled sound level, 82.1. The difference from that and 75 uh, is about seven. So I go here and I see 1.0. And so I add 1.0 to my pile. Now all three of them are 83.1 decibels. Next highest is computers. And I see that um, we've got something greater than 18 as a difference. So I say, this is just like my cell phone ringing in the other room. It's not really adding sub substantially. So we say we're, we're done adding things to the pile. Here is our pretty, pretty solid estimate of the sound uh, pressure level of combining all these things. So our answer is 83.1 decibels. And then I assume sound pressure level were, were what came in here. Okay. Now, uh, just like with um, the inverse square law, remember this, uh, as sound energy propagates, just like when light energy propagates, uh, it's uh, the, the, the illuminance or the sound pressure at that surface is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. I mean, mathematically, it's identical to this, you know, or not identical, but you know, very, very similar. All right. So then the way this works out with logarithms is we end up um, uh, with, uh, well, let me explain the equation. Uh, but essentially, if you have um, this, okay, if you take six divided by 0 0.3, it equals 20. So that's what, remember the 20 log of the ratio is, is and remember where the 20 came from, uh, the two uh, multiplied by 10. So we're, we're deriving uh, to the point where we say, okay, um, we are going to um, reduce each, sorry, if you double the distance between a source and, and the observer, um, you are essentially, um, the inverse of that is, you know, the two to the negative two, you're, you're making it a quarter of the sound pressure. And the way that works out with the, you know, the logarithmic sort of relationship is, um, is doubling is, is, is essentially six decibels of difference. So this is the, <laughs> that's maybe a little confusing, excuse me. Here's the equation you need to be thinking about. Uh, so if I give you, hey, I, I have my sound meter and I'm 20 feet away from this one, uh, you know, loud uh, uh, vending machine area, and it gives me this number. Well, what can I expect then if I was inside that room or right next to it or twice as far away? What would the expected change in my, um, in my decibels of sound pressure level be? So you take your original um, uh, values. What do I have here? 
Oh, I didn't, sorry, wrong. Okay, so my, my oh yeah, they're right here. So the, the original distance, wherever you're measuring from, and you get uh, the decibels in the original decibels on your sound pressure meter. Now, if I were to have a different distance away, plug it all in, and then I find out what's my, what's my uh, uh, decibels at that different location. So, sorry, this last point here is uh, the six, this is why we break it down and we don't just say 20 times log. We, we break it down so the six is in front here because that's our, um, that's our constant, so to speak, for uh, if it's assumed there's not a whole lot of thick atmosphere or any absorbing surfaces between the sound source and where you're measuring. Uh, so we say there's empty field conditions. Um, if you need to assume that, I will probably write, you can assume, you should assume empty field conditions. Uh, if I write anything like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff in between the sound source and, and where, the, uh, where the sound meter is, it's probably more the latter here where we're saying if we have sound absorbent surfaces, um, you know, these are examples of, of intentionally sound absorbent surfaces, but basically if it's, you know, if I describe anything in the way that can kind of blunt or mute the sound, I'm usually referring to this. And in that case, you want to replace the six with an eight. So that's our little correction between if you assume empty field conditions versus you assume non-empty, there's sound absorbing stuff in between. All right, that's the end of... Uh, Subsection 7.2.